want a war, you're gonna get one. Knock it the gun, the trust, the magic. Welcome to episode 84 of Reliving the War, welcome to the 19th of May 1997 and welcome to the final wrestling bios video of 2021. WCW Slamboree 97 is in the books and WCW's feeling pretty good after their big victory last night in the six man tag main event. Slamboree 97 turned out to be a pretty good pay per view, the review is hopefully still up on the channel by the time this video goes live so check it out when you get the chance. The ongoing NBA playoffs on TNT means WCW Nitro is another short 45 minute show tonight not including commercials. Nitro comes live from Asheville, North Carolina while Raw is War is live from Mobile, Alabama. Let's get started with the first 60 minutes of WWF Raw. While the WWF recaps last week's Raw and the superkick that wasn't shown on TV, Vince McMahon says Brett is gonna reveal his big surprise tonight. So no, calling out HBK on the previous episode of Raw was not Brett's big announcement. We go to the arena and Stone Cold Steve Austin comes out to cut a promo. Someone has a sign that says WCW stands for, uh, Wired Captive Wusses? Okay then. Steve Austin says he wants to clear something up right now, he doesn't give a rat's ass about Shawn Michaels. Stone Cold says the only reason he came out last week was because he saw a cheap shot opportunity against the Hart Foundation and he took it. When it comes to HBK and Stone Cold, the Hart Foundation is the common denominator and that's it. Austin says he and Michaels go their separate paths and HBK should be thankful that Stone Cold showed up last week because Shawn was getting destroyed by the Hearts. HBK shows up and he gets a very lukewarm response. This time last year, Sean was the most beloved superstar in the WWF and it goes to show how much pro wrestling had evolved in such a short period of time. Sean says it wasn't too long ago when HBK saved Austin and he repeats that he didn't do it for Stone Cold, he done what he done so he could attack the hearts. HBK has fallen off ladders and cages in the past and it would have hurt if he got thrown off the stage last week, but Sean says he would have got right back up so Stone Cold didn't do him any favours. Austin replies by telling Sean to take his little bandana and go back to the locker room before he kicks his teeth down his throat. Fantastic. Sean says he's the master of the sweet chin music and if Austin wants to make such a threat then maybe HBK will stun Austin and stump a mud hole in Stone Cold and that's the bottom line. The two men then begin fighting and officials have to break it up. Owen, Anvil and Bulldog then appear on the Titan Tron and they laugh at their enemies beating each other up. Owen says he and Bulldog will grant Sean and Steve a title match next week if they can get their shit together. Owen clearly sees this as an easy win for the hearts. And did the Anvil just call HBK and Austin a couple of chodes? A couple of chodes! <laughs> <laughs> Sean says he'll find himself another partner, Austin says the same thing. The two men start fighting again so it's crystal clear these two don't get along and they don't want to get along. It takes a while for officials to break Austin and HBK up before we move on to our next segment. We have a King of the Ring qualifier next. Vader vs Crush was our scheduled match but Vader can't compete due to injuries sustained during the Ken Shamrock Cold Day in Hell match. Triple H is gonna get another chance. Hunter replaces Vader and keep in mind that Hunter already got eliminated last week by Ahmed Johnson. I feel this is overlooked when people talk about the 1997 King of the Ring. WWF official Jerry Briscoe explains that last week's Helmsley vs Ahmed Johnson match could only be won via pinfall or submission. It was apparently a no DQ match. Hunter got disqualified when China used a chair and to avoid any legal ramifications from Triple H, the WWF have decided to give him another shot in the tournament. Bit of a cheap explanation but at least there was some sort of explanation. 
China distracts the referee and this allows Savio to get involved. Savio ends up kicking Crush by accident and this allows Triple H to score a pinfall win and advance in the King of the Ring. Crush and Savio argue afterwards and Farouk has to come down to restore order. It looks like the nation is beginning to fall apart as Farouk tries to prepare for a title match against The Undertaker on pay per view. Alabama's own Bob Holly then took on Owen Hart in a non title match and Jerry Lawler interviewed some random local fans before the match. If you and your wife were to get divorced, would, they, would you still be brother and sister? The guy's son too, he's, well, he's just, yeah, moving on. They're making a big deal out of this being in Bob Holly's home state with fan interviews and whatnot, and it's hilarious seeing people pretend to be diehard fans of Bob Sparkplug Holly. What isn't funny is Bob Holly defeating Owen Hart clean in the middle of the ring. No Shawn Michaels interference, no Steve Austin interference. Our Intercontinental Champion just got taught a lesson from a guy who clearly frequents dressing room number two. The match did have a few highlights though, such as Davy Boy Smith looking on with pride as Owen applied a deadly chin lock. Bob Holly also pulled off a pretty nice Frankensteiner, but the match ended with Bob countering a sharpshooter with an inside cradle, a huge upset on Raw and the hearts can't believe what happened. What will come of this victory? Will Bob Holly get an IC title shot and do it again next week? Or will he do it again on pay per view? The answer is no. Sonny's on a... <laughs> Sunny's on a search and soak mission with her super soaker. This shit just writes itself. Knowing how to handle such a big weapon and being a master in pump action, Sunny was obviously the right woman for the job. James E. Cornette knocks on Sunny's dressing room door. He wants her to sign some sort of contract that must have been explained in a previous advertisement or something. But Sunny says no, and Cornette gets blasted with Sunny's squirt dispenser. I love how Cornette sells it and how he doesn't give a fuck afterwards and he just laughs his ass off on the floor. This made me laugh and I watched this back a ton of times. Sunny then says weather is better afterwards as she clutches her super soaker to end the advertisement. Shawn Michaels is then seen backstage with Ken Shamrock. Shawn says he's found his partner for next week's tag match and Ken says even though he doesn't have much ring experience he'd be honoured to tag up with HBK to take on Bulldog and Owen. So it looks like we have our tag match in place. Just like the Goldust interviews from the previous two episodes of Raw, Mick Foley gets a chance next to let people see behind the gimmick a little. Jim Ross interviews Foley and in comparison to the Goldust promos, the Foley interviews were excellent. The big difference here is that Foley maintains his mankind character throughout while still talking about his real life. And these interviews were so good that they helped push Mick Foley further up the cards while also eventually turning mankind into a babyface. Mankind says the biggest misconception about him is that he's a bad person. There's plenty of reasons to dislike Mankind but he doesn't want people to dislike him over things that aren't true. He's a guy who always stood up for the underdog. He goes on to say when he was 8 years old he got accidentally kicked in the lip by another kid and all the kids looked at Foley as his Chicago Bears shirt turned red with blood. The other kids got scared, Foley was hurt but he enjoyed the attention. He found something he could do better than anyone else, handle pain. Mankind says he found his calling in life with pro wrestling, he could bleed and get paid for it. Foley watched Bruno Sammartino, the Valiant Brothers and Chief J Strongbow and Mick would dream of one day becoming a professional wrestler. Mick then talks about having a tough time as a teenager, other kids would throw worms at him and instead of throwing them back, Mick ate a worm to show it didn't bother him. The story got exaggerated and Foley was now eating a plate of worms every day and this destroyed his social life and his chances of finding a girlfriend. Foley wanted to be loved and he wanted to love but he didn't get a date during his high school days because of these exaggerated stories and this had a psychological effect on mankind as he went into adulthood. There's more to come in the following weeks including a look at Dude Love, a character Mick dreamed up that Jim Ross says didn't differ too much from Shawn Michaels and we'll also learn about Cactus Jack and the death matches that he took part in in Japan. Jerry Lawler says Paul Heyman began legal proceedings to stop Rob Van Dam showing up on Raw again. Mr. Monday Night has to stay with ECW for the time being but Lawler says he has something in store for Paul and Extreme Championship Wrestling in the future. Leaf Cassidy vs Scott Taylor was up next. 
Jim Ross said this was Scott's WWF debut, but this was very, very incorrect. Scott had worked in the WWF as early as 1991, and already he had about 13 or 14 job matches on Raw. No idea what Jim was smoking this week. What's different here though is the fact that Scott Taylor actually got the win. The WWF were getting ready to introduce their light heavyweight division, so they were trying to do something with the future of Scotty Too Hotty, but as you can see here, there was still a little work that needed done. Scotty counters a suplex and he gets a surprise roll up victory, kinda like the Bob Holly win earlier on. Cassidy complains to JR afterwards about the loss, saying he can't take this anymore and he's not a dork and he's not an idiot. Steve Austin is then seen backstage, he enters a dressing room looking for a tag team partner and he finds Sable. Austin wants to know if Sable wants to team up tonight but she doesn't look ready to compete. Stone Cold tells Mrs. Mero to forget about it and he leaves. Did you say something? The first hour of Raw's War ends with Bret Hart showing up backstage. The Hart Foundation are going to make their way down to the ring, and the Hitman is going to let us all know what his big surprise announcement is. Okay, Nitro is now on the air. We have a Ric Flair promo and a Steve Regal vs Prince Ikea match on TNT, while the Hearts deliver a promo on the USA Network. Flair's team won last night at Slambury and Slick Rick is in top form. Rick says last night was the biggest thrill of his whole wrestling career because he erased any self doubt that he had and he, along with Roddy Piper and Kevin Green, took on the big boys of the new world order. Six interrupts the nature boy just as Flair was talking about going back on the road with WCW. Six says Flair beat no one last night because, quote, the wrong guy was in the ring. Six heard Rick say that he could take Waltman easily, but after last night, Waltman believes it's the other way around. Six dominated Flair at the pay per view, so he wants a match against Rick tonight on Nitro. Flair says Six is like a fly in the ointment, and the Nature Boy will have no problem kicking Six's flyweight ass. Flair pushes Six, and Six smacks the Nature Boy across the face afterwards. That one definitely connected. Flair chases Six to the commentary desk and around the stage to end Nitro's opening promo, which I thought was pretty good. Prince Ikea then wrestled new TV champion Steve Regal and the championship was on the line. The Prince defeated Regal before for the belt but it was a very different story this time. Absolute domination from Regal here with the Prince getting in zero offense, a few pin attempts being the exception. Even the commentators talked about how red hot Steve Regal was during this time in his career and his actions in the ring echoed those statements. Regal wins with a reverse suplex followed by the Regal stretch. On Raw, the Hitman doesn't need his wheelchair anymore but he's still on crutches. His Excellency tells the fans to shut up before starting his promo and here we go, more heel Bret Hart goodness. Bret says Sean didn't allow him his right to free speech last week, oh I think you said enough last week Hitman. Bret says Sean proved he was no better than Steve Austin because he took it upon himself to beat up someone who couldn't defend themselves, but Bret says this is what makes Shawn Michaels an American hero. Alright, Brett says his fans around the world and the scum fans of America want to know what his big surprise is. Well, the boy toy is gonna heroically come back at the King of the Ring after his knee injury, but there's someone else who's coming back at King of the Ring, a real hero and a real man, and he too has a bad knee. And that man is Brett the Hitman Hart. Brett makes an offer that he says Sean can't refuse, a match against Brett on pay per view where Brett has to beat Sean within 10 minutes. If the Hitman can't do it, Brett promises never to wrestle in the United States ever again. HBK then appears on the screen and he says Brett was given so much free speech last week that he babbled on until Raw went off the air, so that's that cleared up. In regards to the challenge, Sean wants to know what makes Brett believe he can beat HBK in 10 minutes, seeing as Hart couldn't get the job done in 60 minutes at WrestleMania 12. Sean reasons that Brett's got a lot of newfound confidence thanks to the Hart Foundation being there as backup, so Sean says the Hearts must get handcuffed to the four ring posts if this match is going to take place, ensuring that there's no interference. Sean says Brett can't last 10 minutes in any situation, and then the infamous line gets delivered. Even though lately you've had some sunny days, my friend, you. As real as it gets, folks. 
Sean was saying here that Brett had been playing around with Sunny and her super soaker, and yeah, things were getting personal. Brett was a married man. He did admit in his book that he was unfaithful, but he didn't have anything to do with Sunny, apparently. And Sean's unscripted comment here would cause Brett some issues at home, even though it was Sean who was reportedly doing the deed with Tommy. Still, you can see where this came from, even if it was a shitty thing to do. After the unseen super kick last week, old HBK was getting a little payback. He just maybe went a little too far. The match is made official. Brett says 10 minutes is all he needs to smoke Shawn Michaels. And Shawn says Brett can smoke him all he wants, but he won't be beating him at the King of the Ring. It's a fucking great line. So there you go. The Sunny Days come in from HBK and Brett vs Shawn at King of the Ring is gonna happen. This rivalry is going next level right now and things would continue to get worse. Goldust vs Rockabilly next on Raw, Masahiro Chono vs Dave Taylor on Nitro. With Nitro cutting away 60 minutes of content, it's surprising Dave Taylor would get a match on TNT, but well, here we are. Chono starts it off with a hard shoulder block, but Taylor comes back with a great looking cartwheel dropkick combination. Chono then pulls off an inverted atomic drop and he takes some time to pose after the move. The crowd isn't sure who they should cheer and who they should boo. Chono then no-sells a few European uppercuts before raking Taylor's eyes. Taylor then gets dumped out of the ring, he gets back inside, and Chono then hits a neck breaker. Taylor then counters a pile driver with a back body drop, his follow-up corner attack gets stopped with a boot to the head, Masahiro Chono then wins the bout with his STF. Nothing to see here, like his previous matches, the novelty here is seeing Chono work in a WCW ring. After the bout, Sonny Ono gets interviewed by Mean Gene. Ono says he can make or break champions as demonstrated last night. Masahiro Chono has a debt to pay to Ono ever since Chono joined the New World Order. And so, Sonny has arranged for Chono's worst nightmare to make an appearance next week on Nitro. Chono wants to know who this is, but Sonny says he's gonna make Chono sweat it out. Over on Raw, Goldust asks the fans if they want to see Marlena and the crowd cheers. They don't cheer too much when Marlena comes out to the ring with Dakota, Goldust's daughter who was formerly introduced to WWF audiences through those interview segments. They clearly rehearsed this and Dakota had a few lines to say but she goes into business for herself by snatching the microphone a few times and not saying much. She kinda does her own thing, she plays on the ring ropes. It's all very wholesome but Jerry Lawler continues to be a savage by saying Goldust and Marlena hit the jerk pot with Dakota. Fucking hell. He says the stork that brought Dakota to the world was arrested for carrying dope. He, sa he says the war zone is no place for a brat. And when Goldust says Dakota is the joy of his life, Lawler says Goldust needs to get a life. You'd have to be a right heartless bastard to rip this apart though, I'm sure it was a lot of fun for Goldust and Marlena. Speaking of bastards, here comes Rockabilly and the Honky Tonk Man. Rockabilly has had his theme music remixed three times now by the way. You pick up on this useless and frankly embarrassing trivia when you watch this all for a second time. Get this, Goldust gets disqualified too for hitting the honky tonk man with honky's guitar. It's a stupid way to end the bout but what's more puzzling is Goldust losing yet another match on TV especially after his heartfelt interviews had just aired a few weeks prior. The match was just okay too, nothing special. Ahmed Johnson cuts a promo backstage and Steve Austin continues his partner search while Michael Wall Street does battle with Scotty Riggs. Before the Wall Street match, JJ Dillon says Nick Patrick is reinstated on a probationary basis. Patrick done the right thing at Slamboree last night, so the WCW committee are happy to give Patrick his old job back. So hang on, if Patrick wasn't an official referee since getting kicked out of the NWO, why was he allowed to make the three count during the Slamboree main event? <sighs> Moving on, Wall Street comes to the ring and they remember that he's no longer part of the NWO this week. Wall Street can't wear an NWO shirt so he decides to wear an anti-WCW shirt while saying he's still NWO for life. 
Coincidentally enough, Nick Patrick is our referee, and this match here featuring Wall Street and Riggs was simply set up to show us that Patrick had changed his ways but he completely overdid it. He ripped into Wall Street for hair pulling in order to break when the actual hair pulling was done two moves beforehand, he committed the heinous act of breaking up a chin lock while Wall Street used the ropes for leverage, that is unforgivable, then he stopped Wall Street from grabbing something from his pocket and he kicked Michael while Michael was holding onto the top rope, resulting and Riggs picking up the win. You may call it good officiating, I think otherwise. Maybe this is all a big setup and maybe Patrick is still NWO for life just like Wall Street, but time will tell. Over on Raw, Vince McMahon wants to know how Ahmed Johnson feels about Farouk playing the quote race card last week on Raw, and Ahmed said Farouk actually spoke the truth last week. What a plot twist. He may be a liar and he may be a cheat, but Farouk was right. When Vince was asked a question last week, he gave no answer, so just like Farouk, Ahmed wants to know when was the last time a black man got a WWF title shot, and Vince says there's been plenty of opportunities but a black man has never won the championship. Ahmed says he isn't going to go any further here because he doesn't want to come across like Farouk, but Johnson says it isn't Farouk who'll become the first African American WWF champion, it's going to be Ahmed Johnson. Stone Cold Steve Austin tries to talk Harvey Whippleman into tag up with him tonight but the Brooklyn Brawler interrupts. Brawler says he's the man Steve's been looking for and the Brawler wants a chance to team up with the Rattlesnake. Austin throws the Brawler into the interview set so we'll take that as a no from Stone Cold. And Austin tells Whippleman that he's gonna be his partner tonight and all Whippleman has to do is stand in the corner and watch Stone Cold open up a can of whoop ass. Whippleman agrees while under threat. Farouk vs Rocky Maivia on Raw, Double J and Mongo vs The Steiners on Nitro. McMahon says there was supposed to be a Godwins match next on Raw but they had to skip over that one due to time constraints, thank Christ. Farouk wants Maivia to raise his fist and join the nation, basically Farouk wants to save this jobber's career but that ingrate Rocky Maivia throws it back in Farouk's face. The nation's leader then goes on the attack but Rocky hits Farouk with a back elbow and a boot from the corner. Rocky then explodes out of the corner with a clothesline and a rake to the eyes isn't enough to stop Maivia tonight. Rocky keeps the pressure on with a power slam that only gets a two count. Rock then hits a running crossbody, the WWF promote the Undertaker vs Farouk King of the Ring main event and Maivia hits the rock bottom as Farouk continues to get schooled by Maivia. Keep in mind too that the rock bottom didn't have a name yet. We then see the float over DDT, Rock is on a roll tonight but it comes crashing down when Rock gets his little jabroni smashed on the top turnbuckle, that's it over. Maivia takes the dominator and Farouk wins, not the best way to showcase your number one contender in my opinion, but at least he still won the match. What's interesting though is the fact that Farouk stops the nation from attacking Maivia afterwards, Rocky's allowed to leave the ring while Farouk lays down the law to crush and Savio. We then go backstage where the Heart Foundation beat the shit out of Bob Holly. <laughs> Take that spark plug you fucking jobber. On Nitro, stock car driver Double M Mark Martin along with Ric Flair announced that Valvoline are giving away a car. All you have to do is go anywhere where they sell Valvoline and you can register to win. Sweet. Martin says he's a big WCW fan so he hopes someone at Nitro will win the car. And Flair says he hopes Mark will stick around to see the Nature Boy run six into a wall tonight on Monday Nitro. We then get the absolute pleasure of another Double J and Mongo match as the Troubled Horsemen take on the Steiner Brothers next. This should be an absolute slaughter and I'm here to see Mongo get suplexed. Let's hope it happens. Jared and Scott start the match off, Steiner hits an arm drag, Jared replies with a hip toss and Jared then pulls off a nice swinging neck breaker. Double J then gets cocky after nailing a suplex, Scott no sells it and we see a gorilla press slam from the future Big Papa Pump. After some fighting in the corner, Scott pulls off a Samoan drop from the middle rope and pay attention to this, the long setup, the delay in the fall, Scott pumping his chest afterwards. These small little details all add up and it makes fans go nuts for the spot. Incredible how things like this make all the difference. Alright here we go, Rick and Mongo tag in and Rick destroys our favourite horseman. Big clubbing blows bring Mongo down to one knee but McMichael fires back with a tackle and Rick hits the mat. There's a bit of an awkward bump next where I think Mongo was supposed to go down but as always Big Steve gets a pass. The crowd chant Reggie as Mongo tries to stay on offence but 
Oh, there it is. Cameraman nearly got wiped out too. Rick goes for his bulldog off the top rope, but I think Steve was too close to the ropes and Rick had to change the move up, but it still works. Jared and Scott then hit the ring. Mongo and Rick knock each other out with shoulder blocks while Double J throws Scott out of the ring. Jared then grabs the magical briefcase, but here comes Kevin Green to stop Jared. Scott ends up pulling Double J out of the ring, Jeff drops the briefcase, and so Kevin Green smacks Mongo across the back and Rick Steiner picks up the win for his team. Talked about this before, but it makes no sense that Green would be friendly with Ric Flair while also having a rivalry with Steve McMichael, but it just sums up the Four Horsemen in 1997 really, it's a fucking mess. Still, I saw Mongo get suplexed by a Steiner, so it wasn't so bad. Mongo tells a cameraman to come with him because he's paying Green a visit in the locker room. And when we come back from a commercial break, we see the confrontation. I mean, Not great, was it? The Green vs Mongo feud has restarted now that Reggie White is gone, so expect to see more of this in the coming weeks. The Undertaker addresses Farouk and Paul Bearer once again on Raw, while that Ric Flair vs 6 match that was teased earlier takes place on Nitro next. Vince McMahon cuts to the chase and he asks about this secret that only The Undertaker and Paul Bearer know about, but Taker changes the subject right away, wishing to talk about the King of the Ring and Farouk instead. Undertaker said he's not the white saviour Farouk said he was last week because the phenom doesn't recognise colour. He then says he's not black and he's not white. No, The Undertaker is the reaper of wayward souls. When it's all over and Farouk is sitting in the dressing room wondering why he isn't the champion, Taker says it isn't about the colour of Farouk's skin, it's because he couldn't beat The Undertaker. Vince McMahon presses Taker again in regards to the secret, and Taker says now isn't the time. Paul Bearer appears on the screen and he says, oh yes it is motherfucker. Paul tells Taker to remember the day his mother was buried, the same day Paul promised to never let the secret out. The Undertaker knows exactly what Paul's talking about, The Undertaker hurt Paul Bearer, and now it's Paul's turn to hurt the dead man. The Undertaker must return to Paul Bearer if the secret is to be kept under wraps. The WWF Champion says he needs more time to decide, and Paul gives Taker 7 days to make his decision. If The Undertaker doesn't return, then Paul will open Pandora's box and the secret gets revealed on Raw. Alright, Nitro's main event, Six vs Ric Flair. These two did work surprisingly well against each other at Slambury, although their ring time was quite limited. Don't get too excited for a full blown match here because this one gets interrupted pretty early on. Six wastes no time, hitting the corner kick combo right at the opening bell. He then misses a running corner attack and Ric starts laying in the chops and punches. Waltman's selling here is phenomenal. Six fires back with a spin kick that wasn't as good as his slambery effort, but still, that's the match over. The outsiders hit the ring and Flair gets destroyed. Kevin Green had his hands full with Mongo, Roddy Piper is sitting at home, and here's Ric Flair taking an outsider's edge and a jackknife. Apparently Jeff Jarrett has also left the building, but he's fucking useless anyway. Basically, Ric Flair is all alone. Nash says last night may have been Flair's finest moment, so what does that make tonight? Nash says that all this is about now is putting Flair and Piper out of business, and Piper better be sitting at home strapped because the NWO are coming after him. Strong words there, big man. Scott says when you're Wolfpack, you're Wolfpack for life, as Nash calls Flair and Piper the Jurassic Dream Team, and Nash wraps it up by saying when you're NWO, you're just too sweet. Raw's main event features Jim Neidhart vs Steve Austin, while over on Nitro, Eric Bischoff cuts a promo to close the show. Austin makes his way down to the ring and a fist fight breaks out between he and Neidhart. The Hart Foundation then show up and Pillman jumps on commentary as Stone Cold hits his second rope elbow drop. Austin then goes for a sharpshooter but the anvil kicks Stone Cold away. Pillman calls the Hart Foundation the greatest dynasty in the history of pro wrestling before saying he's ready for the king of the ring. Pillman plans on giving Stone Cold a little payback at the pay per view and I firmly believe Austin vs Pillman was the original plan for the show judging by last week and this week. Owen and Davey watch on from the entranceway as Neidhart hits a clothesline, 
Austin's able to snap Jim's neck across the top rope, and then Stone Cold decides to go after Brian Pillman. This gives the anvil a free shot on the outside, and when the match gets back in the ring, Pillman decides to break Brett's crutch over Stone Cold's back. A DQ then to end Monday Night Raw. The Hart Foundation minus Bret Hart attacks Stone Cold. Shawn Michaels runs down for the save and he throws some weak chair shots. Not quite Hulk Hogan levels, but close. And Bret Hart appears on the stage as the other members of the Hart Foundation get out of harm's way. HBK challenges Bret to walk down the ramp, but the hitman stays put. It looks like Stone Cold's gonna take a shot at Michaels, but he thinks twice. Jim Ross then steps in the ring and he has a big announcement. Gorilla Monsoon has given the order. Owen and Davey must defend their tag titles next week against Stone Cold Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels. Sorry, but can I just point out Shawn Michaels' absolute shit t-shirt here? I've never seen this before and it's fucking terrible. Shawn says he won't tag with Austin, he refuses. But Jim says this came from Gorilla Monsoon and Sean hasn't got a choice. HBK and Stone Cold end up fighting again and the Hart Foundation leave the arena. Raw fades out as officials try to break up the fight. Eric Bischoff gets in the ring and he's brought his little NWO mic with him. Eric says last week in Baltimore he had something he wanted to say to Sting. Since then, Eric has called Sting's home, he's left messages at the gym where Sting used to work out. Eric has tried everything to find Sting, but the icon is nowhere to be found. Bischoff keeps looking up at the rafters while saying this. Eric says Sting's avoiding the New World Order because he's a gutless coward. Sting maybe does want to fight Hollywood Hogan, but Eric says Sting isn't worth a drop of Hogan's perspiration. Instead, Sting should worship the ground Hulk Hogan spits on. Bischoff says if Sting was here, he'd slap the paint right off his face, and just then, Sting appears from under the ring. It's easy to focus on Sting here, but have a look at Red Beret Guy losing his shit. Someone throws their drink all over Eric just before the stinger hits a scorpion death drop. The whole audience turns into Red Beret guy and the roof comes off the arena. And the show ends with Sting staring at the cameras before going back to Bischoff's lifeless body. We don't see if any more damage gets done. A great ending to Nitro, WCW have something really special going on with Sting right now. And it's incredible how long they could let this play out for without people getting tired of it. That's how much the fans loved Sting. Again, we have two okay shows this week with neither being overly better than the other. Pros and cons, swings and roundabouts, kick or be kicking. I'm giving the point to Nitro this week though, and that's really thanks to the final Sting segment. The Sunny Days stuff is entertaining too, but it certainly wasn't the best promo featuring Brett and Sean. There was no real standout matches this week either, which is a shame. It felt like everything was filler on both shows, but I was oddly enough pretty interested in seeing Six vs Ric Flair. That match didn't get started this week, but we will see it in a future pay per view. Nitro now has 38 points, Raw has 35 points, and we've had 11 ties. Nitro won in the television ratings with a 3.6, and Raw got a 3.1. That's a big rating for the WWF in their first three ratings since May of 1996. Nitro's back to a two hour format next week thankfully, so we'll be back to normal head to head comparisons on reliving the war. Hogan's back on Nitro, Lex Luger is back on Nitro, and we'll find out who Sonny Ono has brought to WCW to face Masahiro Chono. On Raw, we have the Raw in-ring debut of D'Lo Brown, Brian Pillman competes in a tag team match, and the in-ring return of Shawn Michaels happens when he and Stone Cold take on Bulldog and Owen. Two stacked shows next week folks, so I hope you join me for the next installment of Reliving the War. Thanks for watching everyone, and take care.